us. So we think there are no shared universal values, and there is no freedom without those shared universals. Vrijheid is iets wat je niet kan waarderen wanneer je het helemaal hebt. Je moet het een tijdje niet hebben en dan pas begrijpen wat je mist. Reverse the question. Can art destroy the world? And I think it can. You can choose either to be abused or not. The political abuse is what art is seeking journalists. We hacked into the audience and then all of a sudden 300 phones would ring, you know. And a warm welcome uh, to all of you. Um, my name is Rogier van der Weert. I serve as uh, managing director for Adesium Foundation, which is a, a philanthropic uh, grant making foundation based in the Netherlands. Uh, a special welcome to our two speakers tonight. Uh, very glad uh, that you, uh, you are here and you will be presenting your work. And a welcome to a, a range of our partner organizations um, that have been kind enough uh, to join us um, journalists, campaigners, colleagues from many places all over the world, so it's very nice to see you all. Um, I suspect this will be a very interesting evening. Um, how often is it that you are in the same room with journalistic heavyweights like these two gentlemen, both Pulitzer Prize winning, uh, and having them share uh, their perspective on the profession. I think uh, there's a lot uh, to learn and to, to exchange uh, on that. And let me just spend a couple of words on Adesium and why, why we put this together uh, jointly with, uh, with uh, Debating Center de Bali. Within the remit of Adesium Foundation's mission, um, we fund and support cross-border investigative journalism, as well as organizations that work to um, secure the enabling environment for investigative reporting to flourish. Um, in addition to funding journalism, um, we also aim to push for um, social justice and environmental justice, working on topics like uh, text justice, uh, which is uh, a topic that uh, Gerard Rao's work has been focusing on. Um, and for instance, ocean conservation, which, you know, fits within the realm of the work of uh, Ian Urbina. Uh, both speakers are amongst our beneficiaries, and I'm very pleased that, uh, that they uh, were willing to, uh, to present their work and, and, and discuss the role in, of investigative journalism in today's environment. The last decade has seen an increase of philanthropic funding going into journalism. Um, this is a trend across Europe, uh, it's an obvious trend in the US. Uh, in fact, I think it's a trend globally. Now, you could argue whether that's good news or bad news for journalism. But the fact is that most of these funders, including my organization, has, have a tendency to be interested in uh, the societal impact of journalism. Right? Not just an interest in good stories and relevant stories being told and finding large and relevant audiences. Uh, but an interest in whether cutting-edge journalism um, actually leads to um, meaningful social change. And this uh, um, notion is debatable, right? It begs the question um, whether it's um, justified to expect journalists to work to, towards social change, whether that's a, a, a justified objective. Um, where does the role of a journalist end and where does the role of a social change or an envi environmental justice campaigner start? I think that's the key question that we're, we will be talking about today. And I look forward to hearing the perspectives of our two speakers and of course of you, uh, the audience. We will be in the very capable hands of Mrs. Yvonne Zonderop, who will uh, lead us to the evening and you will be moderating the discussion. Um, an acclaimed and long-standing journalist yourself, um, Yvonne serves and ha or has served on numerous boards 
in media and journalism, journalism education, the arts. Um, and I hope you will have a wonderful evening. And let's not forget to celebrate excellence in journalism. And with that, I'd like to hand over to you, Yvonne. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for a very nice introduction. Well, uh, good evening, all of you. Um, I hope you are aware that you are lucky to have obtained a ticket for tonight. Because as soon as, as this, this, this debate was hosted, uh, it was sold out almost immediately. And we expect actually many people to listen to us now via the, the live streaming at livestream.org. You can actually follow this whole debate because so many people are actually interested in following this debate and hearing, of course, our distinguished speakers. But also, I think they want to be uh, 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 thrilled, thrilled by the idea that this question, how far should journalists go, where does journalism end, where does political activism begin, and is there a clear division or not? I think that is a very um, uh, a good topic to discuss, and it's very almost um, uh, meaningful for lots of journalists nowadays. So let me please uh, take you through the evening tonight. And um, because of the live streaming, uh, we will all need to speak in our microphones. and. Uh, as I plan to, to engage you in the discussions later on, I will come and make sure that you speak into the microphone just to make sure that all this is pro properly recorded. And even if you want to listen on later or see it later, it will all be soon on the Bali website. So uh, even if you could not obtain a ticket, you can still hear these distinguished speakers, of course. And um, first, we will give the word to Ian Urbina. And I'll give you the opportunity to ask him some questions. Then we will give the floor to Jared Ryle, and I'll give you again the opportunity to give to uh, ask him some questions. And then we will have a debate on on three different themes I will introduce to you later. So but let me first introduce to you Ian Urbina, who is an investigative reporter for the New York Times, based in Washington. He focuses on worker safety and the environment, and he has received several journalism awards, including a Pulitzer, like Rogier already said. And his stories have been made into feature films already, and there may be a new one coming, as far as I, as far as I've understood. He gained international acclaim with his series, The Outlaw Ocean. Ocean. Few places in, on the planet are as lawless as the high seas, where egregious crimes are routinely committed with impunity. That's the first sentence of his first article. He has reported from Africa, Asia, Europe, South America, and the Middle East, much of the time spent on fishing, on fishing ships. And he has a very beautiful presentation he will show you. And I can please have a hand from Mr. Ian Abina. Uh, so thank you for that introduction. Um, thank you, Adesium. Thank you, Dibali, for hosting this event. Um, let me, I'm going to put a clock on myself so I can live up to my promise of staying within the 20-minute limit. limit. Um, my plan is to divide this talk into two parts. Um, the first 10 minutes, I hoped to um, just describe a little bit about the Outlaw Ocean series, uh, what were its goals um, journalistically, um, in, in other words, methodologically, and then sort of topically, uh, and sort of some, some of its findings. Uh, and then the second uh, 10 minutes, um, I hoped to veer a little bit toward the topic of tonight, which has to do with um, journalism at large and whether journalists should uh, aspire to change, to drive change. Um, in true reportorial fashion, I'm going to duck the question um, uh, and ask questions back. Um, I'll just um, perhaps offer some examples of moments in the reporting of this series where uh, these kind of ethical questions um, came up. Um, and then you can hold Gerard and my hand to fire uh, during Q&A. So um, as was th this all run, this is a collage of footage from about two years of reporting largely offshore, mostly on fishing vessels. Um, this series took 
us, I say, so a photographer and, and myself, and usually a translator to about 15 countries. Um, and uh, the, the goal was fairly simple uh, in, in many ways. It, it was to take our readers to a place that most of us uh, wouldn't otherwise get to go. It's the two thirds of the planet that's water, it's the blue on the map, and explore that space out there. It started out with a certain assumption um, an assumption born to some degree of prior research and prior experience. I'd worked on some ships before, um, but nonetheless an assumption, and that was the assumption that this frontier, this space, the ocean, especially the high seas outside territorial waters, uh, is a generally lawless place. Uh, and the goal of the series was to go there, to explore it, and to unpack the characters and crime that exists out there and perhaps attempt to explain why it exists out there, why is it um, pervasive uh, and acute. Uh, and another goal was uh, born of an early conversation with my editor, which kind of went like this. So you want to do a series on lawlessness at sea, haven't we already seen that in Captain Phillips? And my response was, that's just the point. Um, there's a whole lot more out there occurring than Somali piracy. And her response uh, was, like what? Um, and that's when I started winging it, you know. Um, but the next two years was spent uh, not winging it, was filling it in. And so what did that two years look like? It looked like stories that were, um, for example, the problem of a post 9-11 uh, global maritime world in which countries and ports became fearful and new rules came down about who was allowed to enter ports and get off ships. And the consequences of, the unintended consequences of some of those rules as pertain to stowaways and the problem of the murder of stowaways and abuse of stowaways to some degree uh, a direct result of these uh, post 9-11 anti-terrorism rules. It looked like a story about um, extra legal, if not um, legal, theft on the high seas, often at the hands of maritime repo men who were hired by banks or other mortgage lenders, and their job was to go out and find not an easy task, and get back ships that were either stuck in ports because of some sort of scam or um, uh, on the run because of a lack of mortgage payment. Um, it looked like stories about the private maritime security industry um, and this huge booming market um, of mostly post-Afghanistan, Iraq military men who um, worked to a large degree outside of the law, um, which is not to say always or even most of the time doing bad things, but nonetheless operating in a realm that was uh, fairly extra legal outlaw um, because the rules just hadn't caught up with this market, which really boomed after 2008 and as a result of Somali piracy. And the complexities and worries about those um, mercenaries. Uh, and um, uh, in particular, the problem of private maritime security as pertains to a video that we were, we the Times and myself in particular were given of a murder, a 10 minute and 26 second murder caught on camera at sea, uh, which turned out to be at the hands of private maritime security guards. Um, other examples, it looked like a story about, um, for all the attention given to the BP spill and the Exxon Valdez, unintentional sort of accidents, um, far more waste, not plastic, oil, is intentionally dumped in the ocean every year than those two spills combined. So crunching the data, what we found was every three years more oil is dumped into the ocean by ships, largely merchant vessels, cruise liners as well, some fishing, but small 
um, uh, and then the Exxon Valdez and the BP spill combined, so every three years. Um, uh, and so an exploration of the problem of intentional dumping um, and sort of this phenomena of what's called magic pipes, which uh, are pipes that essentially flush really bad waste uh, into the water and why do ships do it and how can you prevent it. And so it was a diversity of different types of, uh, different types of crime, none of which encompass Somali piracy. Um, one of the stories that most um, grabbed uh, the attention of readers uh, was a story that had been done and done well um, before, uh, but we sought to do it again and hopefully better, or at least different. And that was the story of uh, human trafficking and sea slavery. And specifically, though it's a problem that you'll find off the coast of the Falkland Islands, off the coast of Ghana, off the coast of New Zealand, um, uh, the place where it was most dramatic, most pervasive, and in many ways most acute was in the South China Sea, and quite especially in the uh, Thai fishing fleet. Um, this is a topic for which AP did amazing work and won a Pulitzer for it. Um, we were uh, a photographer, Adam Dean, and I were um, uh, in the area pursuing the story from a different angle around the same time. And uh, this story um, uh, is the story that really grabbed the attention of the U.S. government. Um, and I'll go into some of the ethical challenges that um, that uh, entailed. Uh, in some way, as a reporter, when you shine light on a topic, you hope um, that powerful parties, including governments, will sit up and take notice and reach out and engage. Um, but it also enters you into a relationship that can be fraught. Um, so these were the range of stories. And again, you know, the kind of goals um, were um, number one, to diversify the public awareness of what happens out there. Um, number two was to approach this space, uh, the high seas and the oceans in general, um, uh, as a human story more than an environmental story. And by that I mean um, clearly a lot of journalism that had been done, great journalism about the oceans um, had been done through the lens of um, it as a marine space and sort of looking at the residents below the waterline. Um, our interest uh, in this series was to look at the, the, peop the humans above the waterline. So a worker safety story um, for starters that would then back us into the marine story. And there were interesting sort of intersections, for example, in the South China Sea sea slavery story where the environmental story and the worker safety story intersect. Um, uh, to do that riff quickly is to say overfishing near shore has depleted fish stocks uh, so intensely that fishing vessels, and this is true again all over the world, including off the coast of Maine, um, fishing vessels have to go much further out to um, reach a bare minimum break even quota. Uh, that means they're staying at sea much longer. And sometimes they have to go so far from shore that it doesn't make sense to even come back. And thus emerged or became popularized something called transshipment, which has um, been around for a long time, but in the fishing industry involved fishing vessels that go sometimes from Thailand all the way to the coast of Somalia, and they stay out there and continue fishing sometimes for four or five years straight. And mother ships bring supplies, workers, fuel, ice, medicine, whatever, out and the fish back. But the ships keep fishing. And these, this subclass of ships were the ones that we had heard had the most intense sea slavery concerns, the human trafficking concerns, people um, from Cambodia largely, Laos and Myanmar, uh, being bamboozled across the border and put on fishing vessels and off to sea they go sometimes for two, three years on end, um, usually debt bonded. Um, and so the sea slavery story was a specific look at um, this subsection of very worrisome type of fishing vessels. Um, the last kind of journalistic goal in the series uh, was to go there as much as possible. Again, amazing reporting over many years, um, 
on these topics, um, but largely reported by way of testimony from workers when they get back to shore, and much less so for obvious reasons of logistics and cost um, by reporters going out and spending time on these vessels. And it seems like kind of a gimmick, and in some ways it probably is. Um, but in other ways, it's not. Um, you witness things, you get a feel for the space, um, the reality of the people, the demographics of the workforce, um, the brutality of and beauty of the space um, when you're out there. Uh, and um, so the editor, my editors, uh, wanted as much of this reporting to be done actually on these ships as possible. Um, so. What were some already off schedule? Um, what were some of the dilemmas um, to move into the journalistic? Uh, and I think we can keep, I'm not sure where the person controlling this is, but uh, I think we can keep that going. It doesn't feel too distracting. Um, so what are some examples of kind of um, methodological dilemmas that emerged in this project? Um, uh, I'll give a couple of short uh, stories. Um, so one of the video, one of the stories that we focused on, the story I mentioned before, was a close look, an investigation of a 10 minute and 26 long second long video that was on a cell phone that was found in a taxi cab in Fiji and turned over to the police. I got it because a source at Interpol gave it to me and said, "You should, you know, I know you're on the market for good maritime stories, and here's one." And this was a video of a sort of slow motion slaughter in it. Um, you don't see the shooter, but your the camera phone uh, uh, films it very close to a semi-automatic shooter. It turns out to be two shooters. These are Taiwanese tuna longliners. They're men in the water, brown skin, could be Indian, Pakistani, Sri Lankan, Somali, hard to tell. Ultimately about seven. Belief is that there are probably 12. And over the 10 minutes, you see them um, uh, picked off, shot. Um, sort of target practice style as the men try to swim away and they're clinging to wreckage in the water, trying to duck the bullets, but essentially they're all killed one by one. Um, and this was an investigation of multiple things. One, why is this video, which by this time was on the internet, um, why has no country stepped up to investigate this crime? Uh, at the end of the video, not the shooter or shooters, uh, but other crew on the same vessel as the shooting vessel posed for selfies, full frontal, smiling, mugging it up for the camera, frontal um, photographs. So here was a case where you had dozens of witnesses of a clear murder, even if these guys in the water were pirates, which some governments claimed, at the point that you see in the video, they're no longer a threat. Um, so this is a, a clear crime, um, and no, no government was willing to investigate. Uh, and so part of what we wanted to do was, quite frankly, shame the public and governments on that point um, and raise the question and try to judiciously answer that question as to why no one was investigating and what does that tell us about law at sea and crime at sea. Um, Shortly before publishing the story, we were asked by a law enforcement agency, I won't say the name, but an international law enforcement agency, to hold off on publishing the story. And this was after months of haranguing them, uh, sort of beating them over the head about the scandal at the fact that no country had picked up this investigation and was willing to actively go after it. And right before we were about to publish, we were asked to hold off because they were now going to do something. And this is a very, I'm sure Gerard's dealt with this a million times, a real tough call, right? I mean, on the one hand, you don't want to get in the way of a legitimate investigation. On the other hand, you don't want to be played. And you don't want to end up holding back on a story that really should embarrass, um, to use really crass terms, um, uh, those who have not thus far acted and give them more time to do to figure out damage control when that story comes out. So you have to size up, do you believe that they actually intend to act and is publishing the story in any credible way going to undermine their action and what duty do you have to assist them in their action? 
Is that the point of the journalism? Um, this to me is a, you know, kind of 101 level uh, dilemma that you run into um, and no answer fits all scenarios. Um, stowaway story. So a separate story uh, concerned, as I mentioned before, uh, brutality against stowaways. Not migrants crossing the Mediterranean, different demographic, different scenario, uh, but stowaways, kind of hobos of the sea. Um, and a phenomenon called rafting, which is in fast, short version, if we show up in port, I'm the captain of a ship, I turn to my crew and I say, your job is to sweep the vessel before we leave. If we show up on the next stop and there's anyone on the ship that's not supposed to be on here, we're gonna get hit with a $100,000 fine. It's coming out of your wages. So make sure that there's no one on this ship before we leave port. We leave port, the two guys from, usually from Tanzania, it's an unusual um, uh, prevalence of stowaways are from Tanzania. They pop up, all of a sudden the captain says, I told you, and you didn't sweep properly. So make this problem go away because we cannot afford to have these guys still on here. In a happy scenario, the guys get rafted. In a less happy scenario, you can figure out what happens to them. The rafting is the crew builds a raft, they're out at sea, they get the guys off from below deck, they put them on the raft, they cut the raft and they leave. If they're more humane, they try to cut near shore but remember, territorial waters are 12 miles out from shore. That's not near. So if you're going to cut a raft within territorial waters, you're already taking a good risk that you might get caught with guys on shore and hit with charges for having human trafficked or whatnot. So normally rafting occurs 13 or beyond. It's not looking good for you if you're on a raft 13 miles out from shore. And that was what happened to the main characters in one story. Two Tanzanians rafted. Uh, a couple dozen miles from the coast of Liberia, a uh, storm on the horizon approaching them, neither guy knows how to swim. Uh, one is a pretty seasoned stowaway, repeat flyer, the other is a newbie, uh, and off the ship goes. And it's a story about how these guys survived. One of them, they both make it, they both washed up on shore in Liberia. One died soon thereafter from what he had experienced. The other guy lived. We found that guy and told his story. He was living in the shanty town in Cape Town. Uh, near the port, trying to stow away again. So the ethical issue, David Mandala is his name. I talked to David two days ago. David is one of these sources that won't go away. Um, and I don't say that callously, but um, in a very complicated way. We sent a team of videographers to Cape Town to live with the stowaways because we found there was this fascinating world of stowaways, a community of them in Cape Town, also Dakar, but we chose on Cape Town, where about two dozen of them live in these shanties near the port, and that's what they do. They wait for opportunities to jump these ships. And partially it's just kind of young guys looking to have a good time, and partially it's <coughs> humans looking for a place, any place other than where they are, out of desperation. So we send a a team of a still photographer and a videographer to go live with these guys. And, and indeed, uh, these two photographers, videographers, uh, did uh, embed with the stowaways and spent Christmas with them and New Year's. At one point, one of the photographers had to leave, visit his girlfriend in Australia. So our videographer was by himself, and he was in pretty good with these guys, drinking, you know, spending a lot of time getting amazing stuff. Uh, one, and David, my guy, was among the central figures in the stowaway community. At one point, our videographer was called to a location. We had some rules, you don't go and hang with these guys alone. So he was not supposed to go, so he broke a rule. He went, he got jumped, got beaten real bad. Um, all his equipment taken. Um, and so we pulled out. Um, and the videographer turned out to be okay. Um, but this was a turning point in our relationship both to the sources in this story and also to the story. We were gonna do a full-fledged story about this world of stowaways. And 
that relationship got more complicated as once we published not that story, we killed it after three months of reporting and just went with the David Mandalwe rafting story. Um, the police raided the stowaway encampment. And probably because of our story, we had not published that we had, that our staff had been jumped by these guys. We just told the story of these stowaways and what they experienced, but we talked about where they live with their permission. Um, the police raided it and it was a pretty violent raid. Um, some bad things happened to some of the stowaways, uh, not to David. But it began begging the question of our obligation to these sources and to what degree in the very act of reporting on them are we putting them further at risk. Uh, the stowaway community was dispersed uh, and then began again something I'm sure Gerard dealt with, um, the sort of perennial question of how long you keep that relationship going and what obligation do you have subsequently. People, readers came out of the woodwork and asked how they could help financially. As reporters, you can't really um, give, not really, you cannot give sources money. But at the times, the rule generally is you can make introductions. You can introduce readers to sources if sources give you permission, and then you back out of it. Um, but this was, and that happens after every big investigation, but this was more complicated because there was suspicion that the very people we were now helping may have been involved with the jumping and beating of one of our own staff. And so this was a perfect example of, um, I think, a, a, a real difficult um, judgment call um, about how to do right by sources. Um, I'll, I'll finish with one, one quick one, one, one last one. Um, uh, the, I'll finish not with a story, just with sort of an, an attempt to answer the question. I, the, the core question was, should journalists um, try to change the world? Um, and I guess uh, my answer to that would be um, yes, because there's not actually, it's sort of a false question. There's no such thing as doing journalism and not changing the world. That pretends that you can write and not affect the things you're writing on. So the question doesn't become whether to change the world. It becomes how do you go about trying to do journalism in a judicious way and change the world by telling stories rigorously with nuance and balance um, that changes the world for the better by explaining things and by highlighting problems in ways that might help get them fixed. Thanks. So it's not about changing the world because you change the world anyway, but changing the world for the better. Well, that's a nice idea to start with. Perhaps there are some questions in the audience. Who would like to ask Ian Arena a question? Can I see a hand? I see the first one. Tell me who you are and what's your question. I'm uh, Mark, Mark van Bal. I'm actually a journalist who turned activist. Um, I was actually not good enough, and I think. <laughs> uh, but I had a better idea. That's become an activist, activist shareholder in Shell. I fully agree with your last remarks. Uh, it's not why we should change the world, because I think everybody has the obligation to try to change the world for the better. So journalists even more. Um, but my question is also on the how. How do we um, make sure there are a lot of there's a lot of status quo, which is a bad situation. And the tendency of editors are, yeah, that's not news because they were bad yesterday and they will be bad tomorrow. Giving you the example mm -hmm. of Shell, Shell is not investing in renewables, which they should do. And I think how, uh, in my opinion, journalists should always look for new angles to um, challenge the status quo. How, how do you think about it? Mm. So yes, <laughs> and I'll start with that. I do agree that one of the biggest challenges a journalist face is, um, and not to beat up on editors, it's a shared challenge is to how to tell old stories in a new way. Um, there's not much to do there. I do think um, on the first part of what you said though, uh, that um, 
the core goal that I, sort of the mantra I have, so I'm from the US and, and uh, my father is a federal judge, recently retired, and I grew up knowing I never wanted to go into the law or ever be a judge. Um, and yet, in a weird way, I feel like I ended up being him. Uh, not a proud comment. Um, no, a very <laughs> proud comment in many ways, but I ended up in the very profession that I vowed not to go into. But the jury is the court of public opinion. It's just, it's in the courtroom. And it is prosecutorial journalism, and I say that in a non-pejorative way. Um, investigative, as different from beat reporting, um, I think is meant to be aggressive. It does start out with assumptions, and um, uh, it aspires to highlight things, in my definition, I don't think everyone has this, that are broken, and begs for them to be fixed. That's how I think of it, that's why I went into it, but you have to do it in a judicious way, as if you're a judge, in the sense that you can't hide things, you can't pretend if you go into it and your assumptions were wrong, you've gotta fess up. Um, your rigor is your credibility, and that rigor sometimes entails um, defending the side that is getting beaten up, even if they won't cooperate with you. And those are the things that I think make good investigative journalism and make it hard but worthy. Okay, very good, very clear. So second, one second question. Over there. Oops. <laughs> My name is Gertje Mogens. I'm with editorial board of VPRO, Dutch public broadcaster. Um, I think the main problem might lie in the, in the exact matter of how do you define better, you know, to make the world a better place. I'm, I'm sure your colleagues at Fox News would define it very much differently mm -hmm. what the New York Times is going to do. So how do you go about solving that little delicate problem? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, th I guess, um, I think the easy answer is that there are some places where I don't know that many people would disagree that that is a bad thing. So let's start with the easy space. Human slavery, rape, um, embezzlement, uh, murder. I don't think many people would actually argue that those aren't bad things. And therefore, I don't think that many people would argue that an investigative journalist spending a lot of try time trying to highlight those things um, is a good thing. And to do so well makes the world better. Fox News, New York Times, wherever you are. Okay, so that's the easy one. The edges is, is where it gets harder. And that's where I think you get into the realm of um, institutions and individuals choose what they will pursue based on their own biases and, and interests, right? So I, in the very intro, you know, said, I incline towards stories that I care a lot about, worker safety, uh, environment. If, and, and the New York Times employers are supposed to hire people that have a diverse set of interests. Um, some of them, love investigating uh, uh, crimes within Democratic and Republican parties. That's not me. But they need to hire a wide range of different reporters whose interests will fill a fuller palette of, so then the end result, be it Fox News's production or the New York Times's publication, will have ideally a rounded set of investigative reporting that depending on your priorities, will make the world a better place. Um, I, I do agree, there's always gonna be some disagreements um, based on biases, uh, and that'll probably dictate where you shine the light. Um, but I'm glad I'm not the executive editor in charge of hiring at the New York Times. I'm me and I know what my priorities are, and for now, the newspaper finds value in them, so I'm employed. Very clear. Well, we will have more time for discussion, so, but now I would like to introduce, thank you, please, please stay seated. Sure. Well, Jared Ryle will take the stand, please, and I will introduce him to you. He worked as an Irish-Australian investigative reporter for 25 years, also winning several awards and the Pulitzer and Cleave, before leading the ICIJ headquarters in Washington. 
Uh, and I know he's going to tell you a bit about what ICIJ is. Uh, let me just say that it was the organization that, well, that actually was responsible for the Panama Papers and uh, also for the Swiss Leaks, the Lux Leaks, and they all won 17 honors for journalism worldwide. And you all know how much success the Panama Papers have, but I think it's better even for Jared Self himself to tell you that. So please, Jared. Yeah, thanks very much. Look, what do you do if you had to figure out the information contained in 11 and a half million documents, verified and make sense of it? That was a challenge that we faced with the Panama Papers. Um, an anonymous person calling himself John Doe had somehow managed to copy nearly 40 years of records of the Panamanian law firm, Mossack Fonseca. Now, Mossack Fonseca is one of many firms around the world that specialize in setting up um, offshore accounts for rich and powerful people who like to keep secrets. John Doe had copied every spreadsheet from this firm, every client file, every email from 1977 to the present day. It sort of represented the biggest cache of inside information into the tax haven system that anyone had ever seen. But it also presented a gigantic challenge for investigative journalism. Just think about it, 11 and a half million documents containing the secrets of people from more than 200 different countries. Where do you start with such a vast resource? How can you even begin to tell a story that can trail off into every corner of the globe and that can affect almost any person in any language, sometimes in ways I don't even know yet? John Doe had given the information to two journalists at the German newspaper, Süddeutsche Zeitung. He said he was motivated by, and I, and I quote, the scale of the injustice that the documents would reveal. But one newsroom alone could never make sense of such a vast amount of information, so the Süddeutsche Zeitung reached out to our organization in Washington, DC, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. We decided to do something that was a very opposite of what every journalist would ever do. We decided to share the information with journalists all over the world. Now, investigative reporters, as Ian will say, we are lone wolves. We fiercely guard our secrets. And also, when you get a great scoop like this, it's the last thing you want to do is actually share it with anybody else. But the world is changing, and in fact, it's becoming a very shrinking world. And it seems um, strange that journalism has been so late to cover stories in a really global way. And it also seems strange that journalism has been so slow to um, think of the possibilities that technology brings rather than being frightened of it. Now, journalists are scared of technology for this reason. The profession's largest institutions are going through tough times because of the changing way that people are consuming news. The business models that have sustained reporting are broken. The advertising business models basically have been ruined by the internet and social media and smartphones. And this has plunged um, major institutions to basically rethink the way they do their business. Um, the Panama Papers basically, the first challenge we had was to make the documents searchable and readable. So we put them all up on the internet, basically in the cloud. And we allowed journalists from all over the world to come in and look at them. We had reporters on the BBC, we had reporters from Le Monde and France. Um, the idea being basically who best to tell you what was important to Nigeria than a Nigerian journalist. Who best in Canada than a Canadian. We had two newspapers here in Holland looking at the Dutch names. Um, we, sorry, <laughs> trying to remember. Um, we then basically, what we did is we built um, we, a virtual newsroom for all of the reporters to come in and look at the documents. And there they could share leads about what they were finding in the files. Those interested in blood diamonds, for instance, could share leads about how the offshore world was being used to trade in, in those resources. People who were interested in sport could share information about how famous sports stars were and putting their image rights into offshore companies and thereby likely avoiding taxes in their own country. But perhaps probably the most exciting thing were the number of world leaders and politicians we were finding in the files. People like Petro Poroshenko in Ukraine, you know, close associates of Vladimir Putin in Russia. And we even had the then um, British Prime Minister David Cameron, who was linked through his late father, Ian Cameron. And the Buried in the files were these companies such as Wintress Inc, which belonged to the sitting prime minister of Iceland. Now, there were only two rules for everyone who was invited into the project. We all agreed that we would share everything we found with everybody else, and we all agreed to publish together on the same day. 
As we were researching the stories, the Panama Papers actually gave us an insight into world events that we weren't expecting. And as we were researching the stories, for instance, there was an election in Argentina. The FBI began to indict officials of FIFA, the world um, organization that controls the world of, of professional soccer. The Panama Papers actually contained unique insights into each one of these unfolding events. So you can imagine the pressure and the ego dramas behind the scenes that could have ruined what we were trying to do. Any one of these reporters, and we had 185 in the end from more than 100 media organizations, they could have broken the pact, but they didn't. And on April the 3rd last year at exactly 8 p.m. German time, we published simultaneously in 76 countries. The stories probably became one of the biggest stories of the year. Um, it led to the resignation of the Icelandic Prime Minister, and most recently to the resignation of the Pakistan Prime Minister. We had um, more than 150 inquiries in more than 100 different countries. And we've changed laws across the world, um, from America to New Zealand to Ireland. Um, perhaps probably the most exciting thing about this is that the, the technology that is breaking journalism is actually allowing us to reinvent journalism itself. And this dynamic, it's producing unprecedented levels of transparency and impact. We showed how a small group of journalists really could affect change across the world by applying old-fashioned techniques and new methods of working to basically put context around what had been given to us by John Doe. Now, this is not going to work for every story, and I'm not professing that it will. We took huge risks, and many things could have gone wrong, but we showed in the Panama Papers that you can write about just about any country from anywhere, and then choose your preferred battleground to defend your work. I mean, try obtaining a court injunction that would stop the telling of a story in 76 different countries. Try kind of stopping the inevitable. Thank you very much. <laughs> Very impressive story, isn't it? Um, who would like to ask uh, Jared a question? Say who you are, please. Yeah. So I'm Rachel Oldroyd. Um, I run an organisation in London called the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. We're a not-for-profit um, investigative journalism unit. Um, my question is, I guess, to both of you, but particularly directed at Gerard, which is a, um, about the title of the talk today, which is, should journalists go out to make change happen? Um, I mean, when you first started looking at the Panama Papers, were you really thinking about the impact that you were going to have, or the change that you were going to make, or were you just following a story and reporting it out? How important was the impact? And then the same to Ian, actually, because it's, you know, you could ask the same question about when you are looking at stories about piracy or about slavery, are you just reporting the story out, or are you really thinking about the impact, and is that affecting the way that you're going to report it? Important question, Jared. Yeah, I, I think you do think about impact when you start. In fact, there's no point in doing a story unless you're going to bring some sort of change. It's actually one of the three criteria we use at ICIJ to determine what a story is. Obviously, we have to have a story that's global. Um, we also like to see systemic, you know, some sort of systemic problems that we're, that we're seeing. Um, if you've got a, a, any good story basically is exposing a system that's broken. Um, but one criteria we use, which is the third one, is can we make a difference if we report this story? So when we got the Panama Papers, I mean, initially we were a little bit skeptical about whether or not we could do another story in offshore. We'd already done three or four Swiss leaks, offshore leaks. We had Lux leaks, you can see a pattern. And, um, and it was very, gonna be very difficult for me to convince editors around the world to go with yet another story. So we had to do the early research on the Panama Papers to make sure that we had something that was going to be different and that was going to have an impact in each country. So yes, I, my answer is yes, we have to think it through. And you already knew that there was going to be this impact for you? No, you can never be sure when you start something that's going to work. I mean, any investigative reporter will tell you that it's many months of, of sweating over something. Even right up to publication, we couldn't be sure this was going to work. We didn't know how it was going to go. In fact, um, about a week before publication, we'd put all our questions to Vladimir Putin's associates, and he called a press conference basically denouncing us. And there was panic among all of the media partners we were working with because they thought that he was going to reveal everything. But of course, he only knew 
um, Putin's team only knew what we were putting to them, and they thought that basically this was all about Russia, whereas in fact, of course, a week later when we did publish, we were able to um, write about many of his enemies as well. Okay, okay. Ian, would you um, yeah, answer the no, question? I, I, um, you know, there's this saying, the only thing worse than a, a poorly reported story read widely is a well-reported story read not at all. And I think that's true. I mean, the point of this profession in many ways isn't, it can be art, but it's really not art. It's not um, dictation, you know, it's not stenography. On the other hand, so yeah, I think uh, reporters should always be thinking, and I think with the internet era, at least at the times with all sorts of things that are happening where reporters are taking on more and more responsibilities over distribution as well as uh, reporting, uh, it's becoming truer and truer by the day that you have to be thinking about how is the story gonna get out there. On the other hand, it raises lots of along the way yes. challenges like, um, well, where I think the core um, fulcrum is in the effort to make sure that this story gets out, not just quantitatively, but qualitatively to the right people who can do things about it, am I compromising the rigor, balance, quality of it, the product? And I think you constantly have to question yourself and uh, of, of that. So an example of that is this, story X. Story X, you've got great stuff. You know key lawmakers, domestic, foreign, doesn't matter, or, and or law enforcement, who might have X plus three. They have some extra stuff. They're not gonna give you it unless you do a quid pro quo. You show your notebook, they show theirs. So you enter into a decision as to whether you should do that. You also, should you, right? Well, that's a purely not distribution question, that's a journalistic question. But let's make it a distribution question. You want, law enforcement X and lawmakers Y to do something about this. Um, you're going to them not because of their party affiliation or whatnot, you're going to them because they're on the committee or whatever, they have some legitimate substantive reason to be specifically empowered to do something about this. Your question is, if we tip them in early on the story and give them time, there's a better chance that they will do something about it. Whereas if they're caught on a Friday at five behind the eight ball, it might be gone by Sunday. Do you do it? This happens all the time. These are real questions and, you know, we can talk about long-windedly. We will, we yeah. will, we will, we will. Mm -hmm. but also, how, how far this, this is changing, all these questions, mm -hmm. uh, with, with the new technology and the new responsibilities you have. I was just wondering if there was one more question for Gerard. One more question? I, I think there was something very right said, um, that the challenge is to tell all stories in a new way. So I was wondering with um, the Panama leaks, where do you draw the line with the big scoop, it was uh, prime ministers were sacked, mm -hmm. and then comes the hard work to follow it up with new stories, new, new angles. How do you think that is going, and are you also involved in that part, or do you leave it uh, with the first splash, and then it's to the rest of the press to follow up? Well, we've been very lucky with the Panama Papers in that even a year and a half later, we're still um, working on stories about it. And what we found was a lot of the, we had 109 media partners in 76 countries, but of course we didn't cover the whole world. We had material from 200 countries. So we got contacted by reporters from Turkey and from other countries who came in afterwards and said, can we have access to this material? Um, we also published a redacted version of the papers online and that allowed journalists to go and find things that we had missed. I mean, in the first four or five days of the frenzy of the story coming out, we had the Times of London competing with our partner in England, our, our newspaper partner in England, The Guardian. They were finding things that we had completely missed. Um, we're currently working on a major story with a, a major uh, newspaper at the moment, a world, uh, world uh, size newspaper that'll come out hopefully in the next four weeks on the Panama. Again, something we'd completely missed. So with this story, this was, um, this was an unusual story in that it really had a huge afterlife. It just continued almost every month. We, we had a new story from one of our media partners or from a new media partner. Um, 
but it's a good, your question is good, when do you stop? I mean, I think the worst thing you can do as a journalist, though, is, is continue to flog the same story over and over again. You've got to zig and zag in journalism. Editors will always tell you that. There's nothing worse than having a reporter who gets stuck on a story and doesn't move on. I think, you know, we have to, everything's a story for me, whether it's food, whether it's the environment, whether it's paint on the wall, it, you know, we should be covering those stories for people. Okay, well, thank you. We are going to, um, I think, um, after all these questions being asked and being uh, answered, I think it's time for our debate with all of you and, of course, with Ian and Gerard. And I thought to make our not a real debate, more of a kind of discussion on certain themes. But before we start this, I would first like to know a bit more about you, the audience. Who of you are journalists? Can I see hands? I would say about a quarter, perhaps. Whom of you are students? Hmm, about the same. Are you students in journalism? Yeah. yeah? So you're almost journalists, actually. Yes, hoping to be journalists. Whom of you are in NGOs? And who is just the interested public? <laughs> okay, well, I'm happy to that. <laughs> A few interested public here. How about the disinterested public? The disinterested public. <laughs> there are probably some else here. <laughs> okay, so it's good to know. So it's, it's also good to know that we must, if we have the discussions on journalism, that perhaps we need sometimes to explain to you what journalistic groups are about, <coughs> because otherwise others might not even understand things that are quite clear for journalists, because journalists, I can tell you, have many rules amongst themselves, they think are quite obvious and do not even need discussing anymore. So let's be clear on that first. And actually, the first question I would like to ask you both, and then also you, audience, regards a bit what Rachel always also, also said. It's about what's on top of mind when you start a story. And let me start with Ian first. You said something about you having assumption and already wanting to report on things that really matter to you, that interest you, that, 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 that you feel are important. But what's on top of mind when you start your stories? Facts or the reception of facts? <laughs> um, facts. Uh, but again, um, uh, I feel like that line is a bit murky. Uh, um, and truth be told, I'm not usually thinking in those terms when I start on a project. I'm usually more thinking about things like, um, can I do this in a new way? Okay. You know, like uh, I've, re you know, I've, the first thing I do is uh, pull together a two, 300 page clip file of everything that's been written for the last 30 years on a topic and read it and try to figure out, is there any virgin snow here left? And um, that's usually my biggest concern. Okay. Um, that's and also a very journalistic way to think, right? You want to have a new angle, a new way of looking yeah, at it. Yeah, which I think is is a curse in many ways, but I don't know that there's any way around it because readers don't want to. <laughs> and then um, uh, the, 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 the nuts and bolts of the reporting, you know, um, <laughs> is there a budget? You know, how long yeah. is that going to take? Those sorts yeah. of things. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, is there interest among the masthead, the, the, the decision makers of the paper who decide uh, what goes on the front page, a sort of mm -hmm. antiquated notion now with the internet, but uh, uh, will they even, is there taste for it internally? Um, you know, I just saw a movie, I'm blanking on the name, but about um, Native American reservation in the US, and I'm just struck over and over again about that as a story that it's just woefully undertold and yet woefully overtold. Woefully overtold. Yeah, and yeah. it's kind of like a quintessential predicament that I would love to spend two years just on that, but I could never figure out how to do it in a new way that would get buy-in from editors. So okay. these are the questions more than facts okay. or fiction. So it's also about how do I send it to my editors? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But then when you, when, when you win them over, you find them to be very helpful with all these beautiful, you had a video editor, you had a photographer, you had the sounds. And I don't know if you have gone to visit 
this project, but it's, it's, I would really recommend it to you. It's marvelous also because it has all these other means than That's just right. the words. Yeah, no, I think, I think what's funny is that any reporter in the room will know that once you get buy-in, then you're haunted by, I think reporters are a neurotic bunch, uh, I, I certainly am, and um, you know, you're then haunted by, can I live up to it? Yeah. And then you get out there in the field, and if, if you're right and you chose a great topic and it's unbelievable, I, every flight back home after two weeks on a ship was like, they're not going to believe me. I just went to Saturn. No one was with me. I have to tell Earthians what I saw, and they're not going <laughs> to believe me. And um, uh, so I have to figure out how to tone it just right so that it's credible, but it captures what we saw. And I think any story, I mean, that's the beauty of Panama Papers. When you have documents, you're in a yeah. different realm. The yeah. challenges are quantity, rigor, all sorts of other things. But yeah. you don't have to be believed. It's all right no, there. No, it's all right there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, 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 of course, Jared, I mean, the facts are clear in the Panama Papers, right? Yeah, but I do think you've got to, I think Ian's right, you've got to be a little bit obsessive if you want to do this really well, because you're going to have to go climb into a hole that can last sometimes for a year or longer. And you've got to have to be, I was given this advice once when I wrote a book, is that you've got to be as interested in the topic at the beginning of the book as at the end. So you need to choose it really well, because com sometimes it can actually take a year and a half to finish. Um, my first question is always like, basically, is this of concern to people? Because, you know, we all have our own little pet c cares, and we think, you know, for instance, you know, if I was teaching this to, to students, which I have done in the past, the, probably the best analogy I can use is that if you step outside your front door and you step into a pothole, then you're clearly worried about that pothole, but it's only you, you know? And I think a lot of people forget that, that what they care about isn't necessarily of huge concern to anybody else. But if, you, if everyone in the room was stepping out today into a pothole, then we have an issue of concern to everybody, and that's what you've got to keep asking yourself. Is this something that's going to resonate with everybody? And if you don't have that, you don't have a good story. And I think that's the key, the really key building block of a good story. And do you, do you think that journalists nowadays uh, make these questions for themselves uh, strongly enough? Yeah, well, I think some journalists, especially the obsessive ones, which is, you know, you have to be. So it's a, it's a, is, you sometimes get obsessed with the pothole in front of you instead of something that's much bigger and wider. And I think you need to, as an editor, you need to bring the reporters back, which, I, you know, I'm sure Ian has said, you know, when you're coming back on that flight with all this great information, you do need someone to distill that information for you and help you understand it. And so I'm a great believer in teams for this. I think one of the reasons why ICJ works so well is because we are, I mean, you couldn't get a bigger team than the ones we work in because I don't think any reporter brings everything to the table. There are some of them are good writers, some of them are good researchers, some of them are just good people at seeing the bigger picture. And I think you have to have all three if you're going to do a good story. Okay, um, and um, uh, as you may have noticed, I mean, it's really very, very good, good for you to be able to give uh, uh, to all these editors and all these journalists uh, this result because I can tell you that bringing 200 journalists together and let them work together is not an easy task <laughs> at all. Because they're so. all neurotic. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. Let me ask you, what's more important, facts or the reception of the facts? And I want to see hands. What's, who says facts are most important? Okay, that's about half, I would say. I made the other half perhaps a reception of who says reception of the facts is more important. Okay, let me get to see you and say, why is reception of the facts more important to you? Oh my gosh. Uh, because it might, um, you might report it and you don't expect uh, any feedback, but it can cause big results. So it doesn't need to be there, and I'm saying it by experience. Okay. Okay. You're saying by experience? Yeah. Tell me, tell me about your experience. Oh, really? <laughs> okay. Well, only short. <laughs> okay. So four years ago, there it started this Gezi protests in Istanbul, and I'm from Turkey, and I'm living here. So we didn't find any medium to publish our real news. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have been using always uh, social media, and I found myself reporting there because I was the only one to know to use the camera. So I happened in protesting for a journalist in Den Haag in front of parliament. We were uh, 10 clumsy people just saying blah, blah, blah. 
but then we published it on on social media and this person sentenced a lifelong term in jail at the end was released but in that moment we didn't believe at all that it could happen but it happened yeah and that was because you put it on social media um, i don't want to make myself that big but it happened that uh, it arrived to right public so okay. politicians and so it uh, created a, a consciousness a pressure and they had to release her so we could not imagine that in the moment that we were doing it okay, okay. congratulations to you <laughs> so the reception by the right people is very important to ian yeah yeah have you have you had any experience with that yeah, I mean, it, it, to me, it's a it's a journalistic version of the if a tree falls in the forest and no one's around to hear it, did it make noise question. Like, noise is a relational def definition. Noise is something that only exists if it's heard by some people's rendering. Mm -hmm. So news is nothing unless people consume it. I guess the point I would make is people consume it, even if you don't know. And this is sort of, I think, the story you just gave. Like, you put stuff out there and you think, ah, I thought that was going to be big. And it got a yawn. And you move on. And then a year and a half later, some professor or class action lawyer, high school student, writes you and says, I was digging through that archive of documents you put up and this, that, and the other thing. And, and so I guess I sort of feel like you're bearing witness, witness to the truth and, and you let the other stuff work it out. Okay. okay, sometimes you must do that. There was people here who said, I prefer facts to the reception of the facts. Could you explain? Well, uh, just briefly, in the era of fake news, to me, facts, uh, uh, facts, good facts, facts in which one can have confidence are absolutely paramount. And to the extent that reception is, is important, to me at least, uh, trusting the source of those facts is almost equally important. So you work for the New York Times, Ian, uh, but there is, are information sources all over the internet. And it's very, very difficult, I think, at times to, to, to find sources of information which you can trust. Uh, you think so? I think so. Well, no. are, there, are there sources you, you, you do trust? No, there are sources, many sources that I would trust, but you see a lot of news out there that's generated and you wonder, okay, to what extent can I trust the so-called facts associated with this news? Do you, do, do you, I want to answer this, both of you, do you, do you feel the, the fake news discussion as, as hazardous to our profession and to your work? I think it is, but I, I think um, we've actually made some mistakes in the media because by reacting to this whole era of fake, fake news and Trump, we've probably gone too far the other way, and that's um, allowed further criticism. Um, I, I, I don't think you can go beyond, I think facts are the building block of every story, simply because if the fact is wrong, then the story will fall down right away. I do think, though, that you need other elements. I think you need a little bit of both. Um, I think people, you can't underestimate the element of luck in a story. You know, you know, you're publishing a story, you've been working on it for a year, and then the Pope dies the day before. I mean, your story's as good as over. You need to, you know, but you do, you need all these things. You need to think, too, if you're, if you're a journalist these days, I do think you need to think beyond your story. You can't just assume that because you think the story's of interest that it's going to work. You have to think about all the other elements around it. Um, and, and that means, you know, having a good social media plan, making sure that you're publishing on the right day. You know, journalists will tell you in different countries that, say, a Monday is a better day to publish because there's nothing else around. What you really need is a day when there is no other noise when you're publishing. And, and if you're really lucky, there's no noise for a week or two weeks. And then the stories bec become the major news item. And journalists are also, and, and newspapers and, and TV stations are, sh are like sheep. They will always jump on a story. They won't, you know, I learned this a long time ago from editors. Editors don't like to make decisions. They, they only think it's a story if someone else thinks it's a story. So you need to also realize um, the environment you're working in. I think I'm afraid this is more true than some of you may think is true. <laughs> Ian, do you, do you agree that it was kind of Yeah, difficult? I mean, I guess I would um, say um, if the facts versus non-facts um, discussion were defined a little differently as rigor versus non-rigor, yeah. because I think um, you can have a fact, man was shot on Tuesday, 
And that is true, it is factual. But if you don't tell that he was shot in return fire or he was shot defending himself, or there's context to the fact. And the difference between a fact and the surrounding facts is rigor, right? Yeah. Journalistic rigor. And I think what, what you're referring to, the fake news is thin, contextless or misleading context facts. Uh, oftentimes the, what they say is true, but it's completely distorted because, so I guess to me my hope is that real news venues will constantly police issues of rigor and transparency and fake news outlets will peddle in that other stuff and hopefully the public will crave rigor, the, the definition of fair, be it Fox News or the New York Times or anywhere is, wait, so if a thinking person, regardless of politics, came along and s began pushing on that fact and saying, but, but wait, what about this? And stuff emerges very quickly and easily that changes the, the color of that fact, then that's dishonest, that's not rigorous. And if someone else comes along and pushes it every which way, and it stays the color it was supposed to be, even if there were mistakes or things we don't know, but it's, then I feel like that's rigorous. And that's the sort of dichotomy that I think matters. Okay, okay. Is there in, in the audience someone who was um, uh, always busy with the Panama Papers in the Netherlands? Um, let me ask you, what did you do with the Panama Papers in the Netherlands. Tell us, please. Um, I coordinated the project in the Netherlands with the Trouw and uh, the Financial Daily. Yeah. How did it work out in the Netherlands, do you think? Um, I think the impact was quite <coughs> big in the sense that uh, um, when it comes to dominating the news, we did it for uh, maybe two weeks. Uh, a lot of talk shows, other um, media uh, caught up with us. Um, I also thought it had an impact when it came to uh, the judicial discussion in Parliament and a parliamentary investigation came on slowly, but it came in the end. And there's a lot of internal debate within the sections, the banking section, accountancy and so forth. So I think, generally speaking, we had s some impact. Okay. Some impact. It's also, like Jared said, it's a matter of luck um, in the sense that if we had a, a huge name, uh, in, in, for instance, um, the, the, the impact for the audience is uh, immediately visible. So one of the ministers or one of the secretaries of state uh, would have been in the Panama Papers. Uh, everybody would have seen immediately, ah, this is why it's important. So uh, for the Netherlands, it's more a structural story about how the financial sector in the Netherlands is organized and certain smaller individuals, so to speak. And Internationally, we had some huge names, so there was a sort of mismatched in that sense. And how do you think uh, that there were not many Dutch famous names? Is it because, it's because the Dutch are such so good taxpayers? <laughs> we have we have very trustworthy politicians. No, I don't know. Um, <laughs> no, no, but um, y you look at, um, through a straw to one very small piece of the whole system. So we had one uh, particular particular. Um, um, company, which is uh, one of many companies in this field, and um, so it's a matter of luck if in this particular company uh, there are many Dutch connections, and there were actually, but... Uh, and will you co continue at Trouw with working with ICIJ? Yeah, it's a, it's a very uh, interesting cooperation, and, um, and also we, we, it evolves in also in other fields of tax uh, discussion and so forth, so it also has a lot of um, uh, crossovers with other uh, subjects which we do at the newspaper, so it's very important. Good to hear. There was one, one question I was also want to ask the, the audience concerning the Panama Papers in the Netherlands. As, uh, as already stated, uh, there were not many big, big, big uh, tax evasion uh, politicians or rich people who put all their money away, but still many people in the Netherlands got the impression that even here, many rich people will, would not pay their uh, taxes anyway because uh, while they were thinking it may have been tax evasion, in fact, it was just a form of tax planning that, which was not illegal. And my question to you is, Jared, 
Uh, and how, f how far goes your responsibility in giving the public the impression or the fact that the impression stays with the public that's not completely true? Yeah, but I don't think you need to have um, illegality or criminal actions for it to be a story. I think some of the best stories in the world are sitting there in front of people. I mean, what's happening here, what we exposed with the Panama Papers was um, inequality across the world. When I think that, you know, that's something that everyone cares about. And I think that we're all feeling that inequality is growing. And just because um, these rich people were able to um, legally avoid taxes. It, you know, and the Panama Papers wasn't just about avoiding taxes. It was about hiding money. It was about um, you know uh, all sorts of things. Basically, it, it allowed you to play by different rules. So if you're living here in Holland, and you agree by social society that you're going to live under the laws of Holland, you can actually avoid those laws by going offshore. And that's what we were showing. It was the hypocrisy involved. And, and, and I think that really resonated with people. I mean, people don't like to think that they're you know, sticking by the rules while somebody else isn't. And I think that's why the story really resonated. I also think that because we involve so many journalists from so many different countries, they're able to do things that journalists wouldn't normally allow you to do. You know, there was the famous incident of the Icelandic prime minister getting up and walking out of, 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 of the interview. That was actually filmed by Swedish television, not by the Icelandic reporter, because he knew that he wouldn't be able to get that, that piece of footage. So we invited the Swedes in, and they were the ones who introduced us to the Icelandic reporter in the first place. So that famous sort of shot is there. Another great example is Pakistan. I mean, that story, um, we published the fact that the Pakistan Prime Minister's children had very expensive houses in London at a time when they were children. Um, and the pi Prime Minister of Pakistan basically fought us for a year, said that this was fake news, that there was nothing in it. But uh, eventually, a, a court over there found that, in fact, um, you know, he, he was disqualified for being Prime Minister because of this. So it can work. It can work. Okay, well, this is, we, we go to the second theme quite auto automatically, which is about impact. Um, how do you measure your impact, Ian? Um, so there's a funny story about that. Before I did the Outlaw Ocean series, there was a series I did on for two years called Drilling Down, and it was about fracking in the U.S., very controversial. And it pitted the New York Times against the oil and gas industry. And you know, there's this saying about if you're going to go up as a journalist against institutions, be careful of the Scientologists, the Catholic Church, and the oil and gas industry. <laughs> because they don't wear gloves when they fight. And so and that was very true. Um, when we set out to do that series, uh, one of the journalistic ambitions was to sort of, we had this saying, not tell two-dimensional stories, meaning just put words up on the page, but build almost three-dimensional platforms, which meant we finish a story two months in, we'll hold it for another month just to build a really rich document reader. This is a yawner for Gerard who works in, but this is a big deal for us and we were gonna hold, the entire series is gonna have every story backed by this really thick document reader so that the really interested 13 people, you know, could dive deep into yeah. layers and layers, okay. Huge debate with my editors about that because it was going to be extremely costly. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that debate, I kind of won by making the point that we shouldn't measure our impact with quantity but also with quality. And this was the point we made earlier about even if it's only 13 people that go six layers deep, yeah. those 13 people might be the head of the Senate Finance Committee, this lawyer, this professor, that are, yeah. and, and so, okay. And so on the front end, we had the tech department watch the IP addresses of those who were d drilling into the documents so that I actually asked them, because I want to win the argument two times over, could you tell me who so that I can yeah. say, look, I see that's the Attorney General's office, you know? Yeah. Um, and, um, okay, drilling down, finished, and off it went. Um, uh, a year later, there was legislation, there was a class action lawsuit. Um, so to answer your question, I think that impact, the one problem we have in the internet era is to measure everything by quantity. Yeah. And in journalism, I do think quality of impact <laughs> is um, too often forgotten. And sometimes quality takes a while um, to, to unfold. Show. To show, I see. And do you already feel you have, have had enough impact with your Ocean Out Outlaw series? 
enough is a hard word. I don't think I've had, on the front end of that, my editor wisely, annoyingly said, um, this is disparate as a topic, uh, where AP is gonna go in on one place, one island, one set of workers, you're gonna go on the entire oceans, 25 different countries, stowaways, arms trafficking, da -da. you're not gonna win any awards. Are you okay with that? And I said, yeah, I'm fine with that because I'd rather tell that story mm -hmm. that's wide um, and I'm not gonna fault those who tell the other story. But, and so I don't think, the, the Outlaw Ocean has had a lot of impact in some columns, you know, mm -hmm. into sea slavery, John Kerry picked up and ran with it. And, but um, I think that is a journalist decision you have to make and awards are really problem, a big problem in mm -hmm. our field yeah. because it drives what we do. Um, really it does in the United States? Oh, of course, yeah. yeah. No, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> even more so. Yeah. So, so I think um, I think it's an important lesson for journalists to try to get out of that market yeah. and um, pursue stories that might have really great impact, but not the type of impact that wins awards. Okay, okay. The other impact. Okay. Do you agree? I, I definitely agree with, with Ian's comments about awards. I do think that journalism is far too award driven. I mean, we and unfortunately you have to live in this world. Um, but I mean, a, a lot of the uh, journalism you see in America, particularly at the end of the year, has all these, you know, uh, it's the award entries by the New York mm -hmm. Times that year or the Washington Post, you can see them. And they're, you know, they're very boring, a lot of them, but, <laughs> but they're very worthy and they tick all the boxes. And, and I do think it's the same all over the world that we're being driven you know, unfortunately, they're so important to us because it does give you that, you know, credentials that you need to be able to do the next story. But for me, impact should be, you know, ideally, people marching in the street, people being angry about what you're revealing. That's people, for me. Yeah, the people, people, average person getting up and demanding change for me is the most important thing. You don't get that with every story, but if you yeah. can, that's the ultimate reward. Yeah, I see. Because that, that's with your subject almost impossible, I think. I think people. I think also th there is there's also and this is drifting out of investigative, but mm -hmm. you know there's explanatory journalism yeah. where people come up to you and say, "That was the most beautiful thing I'd ever read, and it verified something in my life." You mm -hmm. know, I wrote this piece about secret life of passwords, and yeah. I ha and I was like, "Wow, I'd never written a piece where people related to it." And I thought, "Well, that's impact." Like yeah. one person came up and genuinely said it changed how they thought of or explanatory in the sense of like I really didn't get how like you know NPR and the financial meltdown and yeah. the big short I mean I think those are examples of brilliant storytelling where you take really esoteric dry stuff yeah. and somehow make it interesting and palatable that's impact yeah that's impact okay I can see somebody I want to ask a question Loch here right First, did you? Yeah? Okay, first of you, and then I'll go with you. I'm actually very intrigued with a comment you made, Ian, on your, your story around the, these deep read, readers that mm -hmm. you put up. Um, that's actually a pre pretty passive way to seek impact, right? You Hopefully someone with influence will stray into this and, and do something about it. So where is this distinction between that and actually being more proactive in approaching influential groups? And in, in other words, I mean, my question is a bit broader, I think. So where is the distinction between becoming an advocate for change and seeking leverage to influence the world beyond your story? I'm not averse to being called an informational advocate. My advocacy is to put information out there and advocate that people read it, um, and then they do with it what they will, okay. and, and <laughs> challenge me if they doubt this pressure test color thing I was talking about, but I will advocate for my reporting and try to get you to stare at it. And so I think what that can mean is drilling down and that whole congressional example is a real world example. We've got these incredible documents leaked to us by industry folks. We could just throw them up there. We could just tell, we could not even put them up. We could write the story and I'm the reporter telling the public what the document said and they have to trust me, or we can take the extra time to not only put them up there, but try to explain to people what they say, so that then there's a better chance that they'll, that 
the congressman so and so or law enforcement such and such will say, whoa, this is a silver, been given to us on a silver platter. It's all explained there. And so I don't feel like it's passive. I feel like it's actually the opposite. You're, you're dumping a lot of resources on a long shot game that the right people. So then the question though becomes, all right, so is it appropriate for me to go to Senator so-and-so's office and say, hey, you guys have worked on this before. I've read all the stuff you've done. Da, da, da. I've got this amazing cache of stuff. I don't, I'm not advising you on what to do, but I'm going to tutor you on what I'm going to say. Here's what I got. By the way, if you have anything extra that you want to throw my way, I've got a month more to build even further. But for now, I need you to know this. It's coming, um, et cetera, et cetera. Is that appropriate? Some editors of mine would say, other editors would say, of course. So long as you don't cross any certain lines in that conversation, uh, it's no different than you tipping in sources. They and just have. How do you feel yourself about it? Did you do this? Uh, I think it's appropriate, um, but you, I would want to, if I was an editor and counseling someone, I'd say I'd want to talk about where the lines are in that conversation of things you probably shouldn't say or agree to when Senator so-and-so says, what about this or that, or could you tell us this or that? Um, uh, I, I think I would want to talk about that, but the very act of sitting down with lawmakers or law enforcement before publication of something and giving them a heads up that it's coming and trying to make sure that they know what it means is an opportunity from a reporting perspective for them to say, that's total bullshit. Um, we, yeah. We've been investigating this too and you've got that wrong or wow, you're onto something here and that's actually gonna make my reporting stronger. Yeah. So in, in, in the end, it's about your reporting being as factual as, as the best you can do. Not just, it's also about impact. Let's yeah. be honest here. I'm going there to see Senator so-and-so or Interpol X because I want them possibly to take it up when I publish. Yeah. It's impact, but it's also reporting. I see, also reporting. Okay, is that your, is that clear enough answer? Do you have any thing to? I think you need to be, um, well, I, my, my opinion, you've got to be very careful not to overstep your role as a journalist into advocacy. I do think that it's the role of the journalist to present the facts, but then to step back and allow other groups, you know, um, such as advocacy groups, to step in and campaign. I mean, it would be very easy for us if we were publishing Panama Papers to let everyone know we're going to do that because we know that certain groups would be interested in, 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 in publicizing it. But it's much more powerful, I believe, and I think we've been <coughs> proved right, if you don't involve them, you just let it out there and then step back and watch them um, because they will jump in. If they're interested in the topic, they will. Um, but it's a, it's a fine line. I mean, I, I know some journalists, and again, we, we never tell our journalists what to do, so you do whatever it is appropriate in your country. But I do know some journalists, particularly in Australia, you know, they would go to the police with a story and let them know beforehand, and then on day two publish the fact that there's a police investigation when they themselves have triggered that investigation mm -hmm. behind the scenes. And I think that's wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, I think that's wrong. Let me, before I come to you, ask the audience. Well, I'll get to you later, but first the audience. Um, do, you, do you think that a strong reporting is about the maximum good journalists should do for impact, or do people who say, yes, that's enough for me, raise their hand, and the others would say, no, you need to go further to be making <coughs> more active role for journalists in all kinds of law, law enforcement and law making. So first, who would say uh, it's enough if you just make very good reporting, that's the most powerful you can do as an investigative journalist? <coughs> ah, that seems to be quite, and who would think, no, you just make one step further? That's a smaller group. Well, and one of them is you, and you wanted to ask something, I understand. Tell me, why do you think you should go one step further? Okay, um, I'm, I'm with the Dutch Women's Association of Investigative Journalists. That's a mouthful, sorry about that. Uh, the step further I was thinking about is another step. We had a discussion last week with, uh, on how media report on climate change. There was a climate psychologist there, and he said, there's one thing that you journalists do all the time. You do the wrong uh, bad news uh, conversation. Uh, everybody knows if you want to tell someone you're fired, you don't start with you're fired. You sort of build it up. You keep telling people worse things, case scenarios every time. Now there's a dilemma because read the Panama Papers, politicians, criminals, and the rogue industry that hides the 
thugs, maybe. Yeah. It's terrible. We get our hands on terrible news. We get it more and more. The Panama Papers are an example. Aren't we frightening people away? Aren't we? People tend to back off, like, oh my God, it's getting worse and worse and worse. So what the psychologist said is, how can you help people by giving them something they can do, and not just the Congress guy, but the average guy in the street? And that's what I okay. thought about. And very clear. Can you? Very clear question. Well, there's actually there is a movement, particularly in the nonprofit world, to actually do that. And in fact, there is funding out there if you wish to take it. Um, but again, it's really a choice. I, I well, I, I don't think you should do it. I think that that's not the role of a journalist because I do think that that's going into efficacy. Um, I do think you can report good and bad news. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And if there was some good news out there that was worthy of reporting, then I would definitely report it. Not much, though. <laughs> well, people, look, I mean, look, I mean, people aren't always interested. I mean, what they want is conflict in a story. It's like a, a good television show always has people shouting at each other. You know, it's, it's always that conflict that it's just life, you know. Um, it's what people are interested in. And um, they're not interested in saying, I had a good day today. Um, you know, uh, it's just, you know, I, I did screenwriting at one point and that's the very first thing you're taught is that you have to have conflict in your in your storylines for that reason. Well, this afternoon I must tell you I had lunch with a friend who was a journalist and she said, I'm not supposed to say this, but if I didn't work for this program, I would I don't think I would read the papers anymore by now because it's so depressing all this negative news. So there is a feeling, obviously even amongst journalists, that it's all so negative by now. Well, I would argue that we just need to do our job better. It's not necessarily that we're, we're reporting bad news. We're reporting news that should be reported, but maybe we could do it in a better way. Yeah. What do you think? I don't know. I mean, uh, I, was, I was hoping you <laughs> wouldn't ask me, because I, 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 I think it's a legitimate concern. I hear all the time from my 13-year-old and everyone else that yeah. all I do is report bad news. I kind of, at the same time, feel like and yet, when was the last time I read a story out of Sudan? Out of I can name a million places where there's not enough news coming out, where mm. horrific stuff is happening, yeah. and I, that makes me upset. Um, yeah. That we're filling pages with fine dining and yeah. yeah, things that are effete and um, inconsequential in my view, and not actually so. But at the same time, I do, do think there's a real psychological uh, concern. I would just loop back one second though to the. I do think that when you tip in, I just want to make, you know, make sure that I was clear. I think it's methodologically deeply problematic to inform lawmaker X or law enforcement Y, and then pretend on the second day that this is a new investigation. As was I was saying before, I think what you do is on the first day you say we inform Senator X and law enforcement Y two weeks before publishing, here's what they said to us. You're just transparent yeah. about it, yeah. but you're looping them in early yeah. and there's a reporter reporting role that is clear to the public that you convey. Yeah. But there's also an impact role in the sense that you're now going to see, you've been public about, uh, you're gonna see, are, are they gonna do anything about it? Yeah. I think, and then if they, I think the other, another scenario that's ethically questionable is, fake investigations so as to get the story, but they don't really have any intention of following through, this is a rigor point. It feels great to be able to report that <coughs> law enforcement X is now on the case. Yeah. If you, you really need to gut check that rigorously and make sure that you believe that they're actually going to investigate that. Um, so, sorry to loop back, but I don't know about the depression point you made. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Well, I, I promised him, and then I'll get to you. Uh, where are you? You, oh, your head. Oh, poo, it's all in the corner there. <laughs> Sorry, um, ik ben er wel weer snel terug. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Floris. I work for the uh, North Sea, North sea uh, Foundation, a, uh, a NGO. And I hear many terms that I have in my head daily. Terms like awareness raising, impact. Um, can you give us a piece of advice uh, where can we best jump in making the most use of your stories? Because obviously there's overlap, but there's also a role division here. So please some advice how the NGO community can be uh, more effective. Thanks. 
you want to um, So the question is, how can NGOs more effectively engage yes. with journalists? Yeah, well, um, his NGO is working on the North Sea. That's mm. our, our sea. Mm -hmm. That's, and it's, it's, it's uh -huh. <laughs> sorry. My we Americans just... are bad at geography, but uh, <laughs> I've been on a boat in the North Sea, so yeah. <laughs> and, uh, well, I'm not supposed to say it's our sea at all, of course, but I mean, uh, it's a sea near us, <laughs> and it's. Um, um, uh, how could how could your work be of uh, how could they pr make your work work for them? Um, well, uh, I haven't I hadn't reported on the North Sea in the first round of stories, but I've since been on the North Sea, and in this next round of stories, there's a whole chapter just on Norwegian drilling, and you know so. Um, uh, why am I struggling with this question? Um, maybe I'll pull and answer a larger question. Um, how do NGOs more effectively connect with journalists? Um, okay. Um, if I were to offer advice as someone who used to be in the NGO world before I joined the Times in 03, um, there are a couple of things I would say. One is I think reporters really like exclusive information. And I think um, one of the biggest mistakes that organizations make is the press release. I think it's a terrible thing. Um, uh, um, I never read them. I'll never write a story off of a press release. Um, uh, so I do think that one of the smartest things that organizations can do is really build personal relationships with journalists, understand their interests, understand when they switch beats, understand where they're heading, understand the, the timing of news cycles. Invariably, I get, hey, we've got something coming on Monday, it's Friday. Um, and even if you're a beat reporter who covers that beat, it's very unlikely. So I, I think these are, uh, this is probably way down in the weeds for this venue, but these are really the most consequential mistakes that I think NGOs make in terms of trying to get journalists to write stories about what they do or their issues. Well, thank you. Is there one more? Was it clear enough? Yeah, we could, may I, because this is from basically from the NGO to the journalist, but mm -hmm. also asking how can we be more more effective from the journalists to the NGOs? Because we say there is overlap. We want to awareness. We want to raise awareness. We want to go for impact. But at a certain point, journalism stops. So somebody else has to take it over. And how can we as oh, a community be more effective than that? I see. Um, I'll go short and then Gerard, I'd sure. love you to, I mean, I, I think um, a journalist or a collection of journalists land a big story, um, NGOs have to know that that journalist wants that story to have legs and to live on and go forward. And so NGOs have the ability to help make that happen. So I do think the smart, a smart thing for NGOs to do is study the story and then think about where that story can go next and then get in touch with the journalist and know that either the journalist is being told put it down, move on, or not. If they're saying put it down, move on, then that still means the NGO can pick it up and do other things and the journalist is a great person to talk to about what those other things are. What didn't you get to? You know, that kind of thing. Uh, and possibly take those new ideas to other journalists who are getting browbeaten by their editors on why didn't you get this. If the journalist has still got runway left and is still on it, then that's when you start talking with them about what's coming next, what can we do, you know, you just start figuring out where that train is going and how there might be mutual interest informationally. Okay. Yeah, I think if you see the, the we're starting to report, uh, look for Clues. I think if um, often the best investigations start with smaller stories. Often a journalist r deliberately writes about a topic in a very obscure way or a very small story in order to get a bigger story. It's a bit like catching fish. You throw in a small one, you get a bigger one. So you need to look at patterns. Um, journalists need um, unique information. So if you can provide unique information to journalists, you'll always be welcome. If you're just repeating what, sh what their journalists has already written about, then they're not going to want to know. So I, I, would, I would go back to understand the psychology of a journalist. Journalists, they really, all they care about is information, and all they care about is stories, 
and they've also got huge egos and they also <laughs> care about awards and other things. Mm -hmm. So if you can provide all those things, then you're going to be able to manipulate the journalist if that's what you want to do. But it's just about using it. It's about you know understanding um, the environment that you're in. That'd be my advice. It's mm -hmm. about you know if you see a big story on, on, on overfishing in the North Sea, then try and get some information that will add to the story, not just repeat what's already been done. Okay, thank you. I have two more questions on this F subject. Um, I'm sorry you already had the word, so let me give some other people a chance to take part in, in the discussion. What was your question or remark? It was actually a comment on the last discussion we were having okay. about where journalists should stop and where okay. advocacy should begin. Uh, and we ended up talking quite a lot about reporting bad news versus reporting good news. I, I don't really see it in that way. In my mind, I, mean, I sort of agree with what Gerard said in the sense that you know, it's a question of credibility in yeah. part, right? Um, advocating, when you advocate, yeah. you have to advocate for things. You can't just shine a light and say this is broken. But you have to actually suggest a solution or a fix. And I, I believe it's a very, very different skill to, for, for example, uncover tax evasion than it is to develop a uh, tax framework for the country of Pakistan, yeah. right? It's sort of like the difference between <laughs> policemen and, and lawmakers. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I don't see how journalists can truly be credible um, policy makers while being policemen at the same time. So for you, it's quite clear, the division, and it should stay this way. Yeah. Okay, quite clear. I have this. You wanted a question or a comment? The similar that the gentleman made Sorry. already. It's, it's a division of roles. Yes. So yes. journalists yes. have one task in society, and if yeah. I'm a journalist, if we want to have credibility, we need to stick to that, and an advocacy can take over afterwards. Okay. And I think there is a, a very important role, as Lisbeth said earlier, mm -hmm. the follow-up, yeah. particularly of investigative journalism, mm -hmm. is very often not as systematic as the investigative journalist <coughs> may have hoped for, but he or she then has moved on to the next story yeah. or whatever, and the follow-up which in classic media, when there was enough money, mm -hmm. uh, would have been done on a day-to-day -day basis, or you come in on the Monday and say, oh, I turned the pail to of paper today, and then you, you do a follow-up. I mean, the, the follow-up, which is much less spectacular, mm -hmm. but equally important, that's something we should focus on today. So actually, you, you say to NGOs, uh, make the follow-up of our journalistic works. That's do I translate you pro properly like this? The follow-up is important among journalists, but journalists cannot do the advocacy. They can do a follow-up and say, okay, last year you promised uh, what has happened. Okay. Advocates, advocacy groups can step in and say, okay, you should do this or you should do that. Okay, yeah. yes. One more. One last. Well, I think the um, distinction between police and lawmakers is very helpful. But as a journalist, you always have the... Uh, the question, where do you end your research? And I say you can uh, look around and ask different people, ask experts for what is a way out. You have uh, defined the question. It might yet not be the invigest, uh, well, the uh, yeah, journalist itself, but it can be another journalist asking around in what way uh, could we solve this problem. That may also be an idea, yeah. Or a constructive journalist. Some of, some of them are you, you are head of the um, Investigo, the Dutch investigative journalists group, I would say. <laughs> um, do you think you have enough impact with your group, or do you, do you think you should need to do more to have more impact? Well, I think we sure would like more impact, as any journalist uh, would like, probably. But um, my, my impression on the last few comments is that, that it's, this is becoming a rather purist discussion. I mean, um, I think most journalists strive for a better world, isn't that true? Uh, and uh, so we talk to sources, we talk to uh, people who have an agenda, we talk to NGOs, and sometimes we have a shared interest in the goal we are trying to reach. I mean, we are doing stories and the NGO is actively pro uh, promoting certain goals, but in the end we might agree on where we want to go to. And I think it's, it's much more common than, than we would uh, admit. So uh, I don't mind teaming up with a 
source or an NGO who is the source for a certain period of time to, to get shared information, <laughs> although it's also uh, clear to me that I have my own responsibility when I, uh, where we write our stories and do our publications. So I think it's easy to make a purist division between the, the, the policy maker and, and, and the policeman, but I think we are both in, in a certain stage of our investigation. And if you, for instance, work with an NGO for a while, do you do you report on that? Do you make it clear that you work with the NGO? Yes, I'm I'm uh, <laughs> I'm willing to. Yes, and it's my policy to do so. Uh, I have to admit that I used to work for a, a newspaper who was was more hesitating on doing this <laughs> because they thought if we if we do this, the public might think that we we are well. That's yes, that's, that's the NGO is taking us on on the on the on the lead, which yeah. which wasn't. So you both are a bit purists. I, I, I think everything I've said actually puts me in the murkier realm where he, he lives. I mean, I, I, um, I guess the, the point, the three, the last four points, I think, are all right on the mark. Um, and I would just echo that I think the advocacy I would support among journalists is an advocacy of information. And so, for example, and this gets back to the psychology question, we're invariably asked, Okay, thanks, but what do I do about that? What do I do about human slavery? What do I do about overfishing? What do I do? Like, why aren't you giving us some path forward? And I think that's a fair question for readers to ask, but it takes the reader, the journalist, into the realm of, um, okay, well, how do I respond to that? And I think the answer came from the back row, which is yeah. you rigorously go to a panel of experts that you trust, yeah. including competing views, opposed yeah. views, and you ask them to explain to the reader and then you say, I'm not weighing in. I think these people are all pretty rigorous. They disagree on some points. Here's what they say. Yeah. I think that's um, advocacy to some degree of information in a rigorous fashion that also attempts to address the yeah. morale concerns raised earlier. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm being purist. I think there's shades of gray in everything, just like every story. I don't think there's all right or all wrong, and I don't advocate that there is. So, uh, you know, I think we should be all welcome. We, we should welcome every opinion, basically, on this. I'm, I'm happy. But my feeling is, is instinct is that you actually have more impact if you're seen as being neutral and completely neutral. And you know, you're actually doing the advocacy work a service by being neutral. I just think neutral, I guess I would just throw out that neutral is a term that feels good to say, but it's hard to actually um, rigorously unpack because it's, it's not neutral, for example, to say that it is wrong, and I agree that it is wrong, for people who have money to game a tax system and get away with um, legal, but somewhat unethical, unlevel playing field type behavior. And so at the outset, I think we make a decision that is not neutral, that like some things we're highlighting are, like I, I think it's also not neutral to start out with the assumption that human trafficking wrong, is wrong or unregulated maritime private security is wrong or there are a lot of things that you start out with certain assumptions and then proceed from there and you can be rigorous mm -hmm. but I guess I just don't believe there is true neutrality. Um, okay. Okay. okay, 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 okay. Well that's also a very nice thing to say in the end because it makes us, it gives us all think of the idea there is still some space between being a journalist. Yeah, we set that up to end okay. on that. <laughs> very good, very good. There is one small last question I would like to ask you, and then I'm going to invite you all to say, well, listen, we're going to discuss this further at the bar. But there's one more question I would like to ask both of you. Uh, investigative journalists are uh, perceived to be the heroes of these times. How come, do you think, Jared? Oh, I, I'm not sure we are. I, I think we're only doing what we should have been doing for years. I do think that we've created a lot of problems for ourselves by not doing journalism for so long. You know, I mean, you know, I've been a journalist for 30 years, and I can tell you that there has been no golden age of journalism. We all look back at it now and say, you know, oh my God, the business models are failing, everything, so the world is doomed. But when things were going really well, we weren't doing a lot of investigative reporting. I actually did some research recently too, where you know, even in the golden era, you know, we think about Watergate as being the the peak time for investigative reporting, as we all piled in afterwards. 
the number of stories on the front pages of the major, major American newspapers at the time were, were minuscule. I think it was one or two percent. So we've never really had, and I think that, you know, I guess my point here is that when things were going really well and we were making lots of money, we weren't doing the kind of journalism that we should have been doing. Okay. And I think we're paying the price for it now. With little money and lots yeah. of efforts. Yeah. Okay, agree, Ian? New York yeah, Times I too. agree. No, I, I agree. Um, I think my point would be a cousin, um, which is to say, I do think that there's um, a mystique around investigative journalism, and I think it's when I sit with my colleagues who are beat reporters, mm -hmm. who are on brutally crushing beats, where they have to churn out three stories, four stories, five stories a week yeah. uh, on complicated stuff, yeah. I feel ashamed <laughs> because I have this luxury of time that affords me a rigor. Um, and so I think, um, I think there, it is true that investigative journalists are um, seen in this certain way. But I think it's largely because we got lucky and are given so much time in the best of scenarios to dig right. in a way that our colleagues aren't. Okay. Uh, and so that's, that's all that okay. is the difference. Okay, okay. Well, that's also a, a very honest answer. Well, both to you, thank you very much for coming here, for sharing all your ideas and your information with us. I want to thank you, the audience, for being here tonight and for taking part in this interesting discussion. And as we have seen, there are no clear answers. I mean, uh, if I look and ask you for what do you think of seeing both hands on both stands, so there is no clear right or wrong, there is no clear division. Although I've heard a lot of you say that um, sticking to the facts and being a journalist and making a difference between journalists and actually advocates would actually help journalism to stay strong in the long term. So, and that is perhaps a thing further to discuss at the bar, <laughs> but something to think of at least. So thank you very much for coming here and hope to see you soon again. Bye-bye. Thank you.